evening, everyone. It's great to see you back, to have you back here. And uh, this is already lecture number seven, the second last of module number four. And it's amazing when we look back to see how fast this year has gone and this module as well. Next week, we'll have the final module uh, in uh, the final lecture, rather, of module uh, number four. And uh, then the year is gone. And before you know, um, we're out there hopefully living out what we've learned. And I trust that this be, has been a good learning experience for you. Tonight we will be looking at the church's mission. I guess one of the questions we could ask is why God in His infinite power and all knowledge and the fact that He knows everything, why has He not just saved us and sent us directly to heaven? Uh, as someone said, it may, for some people it's actually better to get them saved and shoot them so they can go straight to heaven uh, immediately after that. And I guess for us it's a frustration sometimes knowing that uh, we, we're looking forward to eternity, something we'll talk about next week when we talk about the second coming. But at the same time, knowing that God has left us here for a purpose. And in a certain sense, we could ask the same question of Jesus. He came to this world with a very specific purpose in mind. And what I do find interesting is that Jesus never rushed it. He didn't jump out there at the age of five or six and try to change the world. He was uh, obedient and submissive to his father and to the human nature that he took upon himself when he was born as a human being. And he grew up in the normal fashion, in a normal Jewish society, and at the age that was regarded as normal to enter into some form of ministry to become a rabbi, at the age of about 30, he entered into ministry. But then he worked with a purpose, with a very specific purpose, because he was on a mission. And uh, Jesus worked for three years, maybe four years, three and a half years, and then he died, he rose again, and then he ascended to heaven. But before he did, he left his disciples in other words, he left the church with a particular task, uh, a mission to fulfill in this world. And this is one of the descriptions of that task that he has given to us in Matthew 28. We know the, the story and the passage very well. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end, to the very end of the age. And so Jesus essentially told his disciples, I have all authority. And so that's just confirming the fact that He is God. We have looked at Jesus and who He is uh, earlier on. Jesus also then sends His disciples because He is going to leave this world physically. His physical body will leave this world. And He left His disciples with a task. We call it the Great Commission. To go and make disciples, to baptize and teach uh, them, and so on. And then Jesus promised that he would never leave us. He would be with us as we go and as we make disciples. And so there's a task before the church. And uh, Luke describes it slightly differently with a different emphasis uh, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, uh, which is the second volume that Luke put together. And again it says, it starts in verse 6, uh, So when they met together, they, the disciples, asked Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. We'll come back to this verse next week when we look at the second coming. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. For those of you who attended the New Testament module, uh, module number three, you may remember when we uh, paused for a moment in the book of Acts, we looked at this particular verse as a key verse where Luke, in a certain sense, is setting the agenda for the way he was going to put 
this volume, the book of Acts, together. And so it is, in the first number of chapters of the book of Acts, we find the, the apostles, the early disciples, working uh, in Jerusalem, establishing a very large church in Jerusalem. From there they went out and they were scattered as a result of a persecution. But as they went, they preached the gospel in Judea. And many places in Judea heard the gospel. And then they went to Samaria, which is what Jesus promised them, them here, or foretold that is going to happen. And then uh, to the ends of the earth. And uh, from chapter 11, when the gospel... Well, chapter 10, really, where Peter reaches out to Cornelius, who is a Roman. And then in chapter 11, where the gospel reaches Antioch and Syria. And in chapter 13, when uh, Saul and Barnabas are set apart by the, by the church in Antioch to go into the world as missionaries. From that point on, the gospel just spread everywhere. That's the story of the book of Acts. Last week, we looked very briefly at a summary of church history, and, and we were only able to really cover uh, the main points of church history. But that is really what the church has been doing. Well, in a certain sense, I should say what the church is, was supposed to be doing. The church has not always been effective in taking the gospel in the world. But here we have very clearly a command, a prophecy, and that command has been followed by the church for many ages in varying degrees. But Jesus said that I would be with you and you will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And the, the, the promise and the command has been followed but has not been completed. And it's one of the things we will be looking at tonight and that is the task before us as a church. And so why does God not save people and take them into heaven? Immediately, because God has a task for us. That's precisely why Jesus, when He ascended, left His apostles, those very dear people to Him, those who became His friends, those who journeyed with Him for three years here on earth. He left them here uh, with the Holy Spirit, which was fulfilled. The promise was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, uh, when, the, when the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. But from that point on, the disciples moved out. And they believed they had a task. And we, 2,000 years later, still need to look at that as part of the calling that is upon our lives. The church in general, but also every individual person here, every one of us has a task to take the gospel into the world. So before we get into the lecture time, let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing upon us for today. Father, we thank you for... This time together, we thank you for the past few weeks where we have been able to delve into your word, uh, looking at the bigger picture as we looked at who you are and, and how you work in the world as well as how you work in our own lives. And I pray that as we journey through this lecture tonight, that you would give us some insight into the task before us, before each one of us individually, but also before us as a church. And Lord, help us to make our contribution to make your kingdom grow and your kingdom extend in this world. Help us to continue to pray, Lord Jesus, as you taught us to pray, our Father who is in heaven, that your name be glorified, that you, your name be made holy, and that your kingdom come and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is part of our task here, Lord, and I, I pray that you would encourage us and and, and uh, give us power and give us authority to move out and to spread the kingdom, your kingdom, uh, in this world. So bless us tonight, Lord. Give us open eyes and hearts and minds to understand and to accept the truths of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know the big picture and the story uh, so far. You know it very well. Uh, God exists in and of himself from all eternity. It is God who created humankind in His image. Humans sinned against God, and God, uh, pursue, God is pursuing us uh, with His salvation. He has been doing that in the Old Testament. He is continuing to do that in the New Testament era by sending Jesus into this world. And then, before He left, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, and He dwells in us, He empowers us, He equips us to live for Him, and to do precisely what we are going to talk about uh, tonight. 
it is God who established the church. We called that a faith community last week. That faith community was the nation of Israel primarily in the Old Testament, and I'm sure that God had other people in the world as well at that time, people whom He brought into His faith community by bringing them in contact uh, with His nation Israel. In the New Testament, God works through the church, and the church is the extension of what God uh, was doing in the Old Testament. The, the church is the continuation of that faith community. And we looked at both the Old Testament picture as well as the New Testament picture of the church last week. And we briefly touched on the fact that the church has a task here on, on earth. Part of our task here on earth is to bring glory to God by doing the work to which He has called us. And that work is to worship Him, to live for Him, to uh, reach out into the community, our community here on earth, uh, to reach those who are not believers, those who are sinners. And um, we then briefly looked at the reason why God left the church and why God established the church, and that is to do God's work, uh, by, uh, by, to bring glory to God by doing God's work uh, here on earth. And one of the primary ways in which we glorify God is by taking the gospel into the world. And that is what this lecture uh, tonight is all about. We look at the task of the church. We look at the role of the church in sharing the gospel. Uh, I will also spend some time defining some terms and, talk, and going o over some terminology uh, that may be confusing in, in some of our minds. And then we'll look at the spreading of Christianity around the world. And we'll look at the challenge that is still remaining, the task that is still remaining. Uh, after 2,000 years, the task is still not complete, and that is why we are still here. And that's why uh, next week we'll look at how the picture will be completed when Jesus comes back, uh, which we refer to as the second coming. I'll also refer during the course of the, uh, the lecture time to some of the debates and discussions among Christians when it comes to this whole concept of missions. In your reading, uh, there's lots to read in the Old Testament, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Uh, we have been over those chapters again and again and again, but it lays the foundation for everything else that follows in, in the Old Testament. Uh, several of the prophets also refer to not so much the word missions, but God's care for the nation and nations. And, and oftentimes it comes across as judgment, where God is judging the nations. But we have a beautiful picture in Jonah chapter 3, for example, where Jonah is sent to a foreign city. In fact, it's an enemy city, the capital city of the Assyrians. And he preaches a, a very judgmental, short little one-liner um, sermon. And the whole city comes to know God. The whole city turns to God. And um, it shows God's care for them. And we have similar passages, many other passages in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, the book of Acts tells us, and I started reading from that, but it really tells us about the church taking its task seriously. And um, God left us here for a purpose. And then you can go to Romans chapter 10 where Paul talks about uh, how the gospel needs to, to go out. And that it's through the preaching, the proclamation of the word. It's through the hearing. And then faith is stimulated in our hearts. And it's when we hear the gospel that we respond to the gospel through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we can't simply say, well, God will be out there saving people. Interestingly enough, God has left or Jesus has left His apostles here on earth. He gave them the task to preach the gospel. And therefore, we have a similar task, and that is to preach the gospel. Not just in the way we live, but of course, the way we live uh, confirms what we are telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our textbooks, uh, both Grudem and Milne, and any other theological book will refer uh, to some extent to this particular concept of missions. It is not normally seen as a major topic of systematic theology or uh, dogmatics. But it is an important concept in terms of the task of the church. And so more often than not, under the study of ecclesiology, uh, you will pick that up where there is reference to the task that remains uh, to be done by the church. But most of the practical information that I have 
uh, gathered a little bit later on, not in the early part of the, the lecture, uh, come from this book called Operation World. And uh, it has been published now several times and republished, and this is the latest edition, uh, the 2010 edition of Operation World. And Patrick Johnston is the man who started with this vision to get the information about the, the countries in the world together in one single volume. And then to ask Christians to pray, to pray for the world, because it's all about reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to get hold of this copy. Um, it is a wealth of information. And um, in the next five to ten years, there will be another edition. But for now, uh, this is the latest information. And every single country in the world is covered in this book, alphabetically. And then you can start praying. Uh, there was a time, and I haven't done it recently, but some years ago with an earlier edition of this where I prayed for a whole year long, and I prayed it was then divided in by the day of the year, like the 1st of January, 2nd of January, and so on. And I prayed through this book for a whole year. And my eyes were open to discover information about what is happening in the world. It contains political information. What is the political status of a country? Um, and the languages, the people groups in that particular country, and then it zeroes in on the, the uh, status of the gospel or Christianity within that particular country. It makes all sorts of different distinctions. It has addendums with lots and lots of information, and I can only highly recommend this. And some of the information that I will share with you later on uh, come from the uh, website that is run by the same organization called uh, Operation World. It's now under the uh, uh, editorship of uh, other people because uh, Patrick Johnston uh, is no longer directly involved. He is involved but not directly involved in that anymore. But I can only encourage you to get a copy uh, of that. Now when we look at the topic of tonight we're really talking about what theologians call missiology. And the word the missio is the Latin for mission and therefore the study of missions. And, and that is what we are going to look at tonight. By way of background, the church both in the Old and the New Testament is God's design. It is God who works through His community of believers to bring about His purposes. God works in the life of the individual. He works in my life, in your life, individually. But God also brings us together. This is one of the major truths that we uh, shared last week when we looked at the church. And that is that God is in the habit of bringing individuals into a faith community because it's not good for man to be alone, to quote that particular reference in Genesis chapter 2 again. God started the process of reaching out to people in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 3 when God came uh, to Adam and Eve when they fell into sin. And God continues to do that. He continues to pursue uh, His people and His creation. The culmination of it all will happen at the second coming. In the meantime, we're looking back 2,000 years ago when Jesus came into this world, took upon himself a human body, uh, and ultimately died for our sins to reconcile us with God. So we are Christians. We, we are already share in so many of the privileges that we are going to share in when we get to heaven one day and when we get to eternity. Uh, but it is only at the second coming of Jesus that our um, relationship with God, our worship, uh, bringing glory to God and sharing in the glory of God, all of those things will reach its finality uh, when, we are in, in God's, uh, when we are in heaven with God. Now, if we look at how we define this concept we talk about is mission or missions, and I will make another distinction uh, a little bit later on when we talk about whether it's mission or missions. Um, where it all started? Well, it started in the heart of God. God desires to commune with His creation. God created the universe, created the earth, created human beings in order to have fellowship with us and in order for creation to reflect His glory. Not that God had need for that. We already said that uh, much earlier. Um, but we didn't bring glory to God the way we should have. We fell into sin. Mankind fell into sin. And therefore we um, marred the image of God. Um, we disturbed the image of God, uh, that God which, with which God created us. 
And despite our sin and our sinfulness, God still reached out to sinners in love. God still came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God still called Abraham in to, uh, to start a faith community. God still included hundreds and thousands of people in that faith community. God still entered into this world through, in and through Jesus Christ. And what God has done um, for us by reaching out to us, God wants His children now to emulate, to continue to do, which is why Jesus gave us a command, and that is, as Jesus came, in fact, He said that at the end of John, as the Father sent me, I now send you. Jesus was on a mission, and when He left to go to heaven, He has now left us with that same mission, the mission for which Jesus came uh, into this world. So, the role of the church and its members is to bring more sinners to God, and the more people who come to God and come to a personal knowledge of God, the more people who are included into this faith community, the more God is glorified. And therefore, Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And as we look at this world around us, we acknowledge that God's kingdom is not seen everywhere yet. Ultimately, God is in control, but there are many places in this world where God's kingdom is not yet seen. What is kingdom? Kingdom is where God rules. God needs to rule in my life. So praying this prayer that Jesus taught us means I'm praying for myself, number one. First of all, I need to submit to the kingdom of God, to His rulership, His authority in my life. I need to let His will be done in my life as it is in heaven. But at the same time, I look around me and I see many, many people who have not yet come to faith in God. And the best way that God is glorified is when people become Christians, when they become followers of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the Son of God, and by following Jesus, we bring glory uh, to God. Now, God's mission is, in one single term, Jesus, or in, in one single word. Jesus Christ is God's mission. Here is a quote from uh, Kevin Roy's notes, and it says, Jesus was a man with a mission, he was driven by the all-consuming passion to do His Father's will and to fulfill all He had been sent to do. In His dying moments, He was able to cry out, It is finished. And let me remind you of another verse, uh, and that is in the high priestly prayer, as we refer to that in John chapter 17. Jesus prays and He says, Father, the time has come. Glorify Your Son that Your Son may glorify You. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then Jesus says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And that was both historically looking back at what Jesus came to do at that point in time, as well as prophetically because in the next day, in the next few hours, Jesus would have given, Jesus was going to give His life and die on the cross. And in all of what Jesus came to do on earth, He was completing the work of God and He was doing the will of God and thereby He was giving glory to God, which is why Jesus said, I have brought you glory by completing the work that you have given me. How can we give glory to God? Well, the answer is to follow Jesus by completing the work that He has given us. That's the best way in which we can ever bring glory to God. I, I think it is great to be at home alone and to have a little bit of a worship time uh, and to pray to God and to praise God. But ultimately, God is more and better glorified when we are out there in the world and living out the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel with an unsaved world because God is best glorified when sinners come to faith in Him. The term Missio Dei means God's mission or God is on a mission. And here is a quote from uh, Wikipedia. It says, Missio Dei is a Latin theological term that can be translated as the sending of God or God's mission, if you wish. Mission is understood as being derived from the very nature of God. The missionary initiative comes from God alone. Mission is not primarily an activity of the church, but an attribute of God. Now, when you read that and you think about it carefully, it is mind 
changing. Because oftentimes we think we are going to do stuff for God. Whereas in a certain sense, God has already done it. He's already made provision in and through Jesus Christ. God is on a mission in this world. And what I, you and I need to do is to join God in His mission in this world. It's not us doing stuff for God. It is God who's already on a mission. And all we need to do is to align ourselves with what God is doing uh, in this world. And that is what this quote essentially uh, is saying. So God's mission, therefore, is the church's task, or to change it around. The church's task in this world is to be on God's mission. The church, just like Jesus' ministry, is all about God's purposes. We will miss our reason for existence if we miss this point. Which is why oftentimes I believe God allows churches to die. Because they have missed the point. They have become a social club. They are a wonderful place to be. There is great fellowship. I have wonderful friends there. But they have no mission. Their, their only mission is to pat one another on the back. And I'm not surprised if churches like that die. Because they have lost their reason for existence. Our reason for existence as a church, and I'm talking most generally about the church of Jesus Christ, and then as it finds expression in a local church. Our reason for existence is we are on a mission, and that is God's mission in this world. Jesus clearly understood his mission uh, in this world to be the fulfillment of the Father's desire, and he was doing the Father's will. And uh, that's what I read earlier on in John 17, 4. And in John chapter 4, Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. And when the disciples came back and offered him some food, he said, I have food that you don't know of. And they, they were perplexed. And Jesus then said, uh, my food is to do the will of God. In other words, that is really what satisfies me most. And that is to be in the will of God, to do the will of God. So what is the will of God? That is to be on God's mission in this world. A church, therefore, as God's community, focuses on doing the will of God. And God's will is that His kingdom be extended when sinners come into a personal relationship with Himself. Now, as I said earlier on in the introduction, the church has been on this mission. There is no doubt that the church has had varying degrees of success when it comes to doing exactly that. The church has left a legacy. Uh, it took the early Jewish disciples a while to figure out that they were called by God and by Jesus to go to the Gentile world, including the Jewish world. But for a, a while, they focused on the Jewish world only. And it was in Acts chapter 10, uh, which I mentioned earlier on, that, that Peter received that vision from God. And he then ended up going to Cornelius. And something clicked in his mind. Uh, it wasn't that he's contemporaries back in Jerusalem were quite excited about his visit to Caesarea and to a Roman. Um, but, but after he explained to them, they started buying in. And slowly but surely, as you read the story in the book of Acts, you see the, the shift, uh, almost like the, the weight is shifting uh, from focusing only on the Jews to focusing on the calling, and that is to go into the world. And that is why you find the Apostle Paul and we don't have a description in the Bible of all of the other apostles. But when you read the early church history, it's very clear that they all went on a mission. Some of them, uh, we only have legends uh, left to us or uh, early church traditions or uh, traditions that were told. Uh, we haven't got a description of what they have done. But it is believed that every single one of the apostles, somehow or the other, went out on a mission uh, into the world. And... And after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, they had no choice but to be out there anyway. Uh, but it is following the story of the Apostle Paul, where you find him and, and Barnabas and others going out into the world. And then if you uh, look at um, early church missionaries, uh, after the death of Paul, and again this is a quote from Kevin Roy's notes, others took up the torch of world evangelization. Uh, Ulfilas took the gospel to the Goths. Patrick is celebrated as the Apostle of Ireland, and Boniface, the Apostle of Germany. Cyril and Methodius planted churches among the Slavs. And then there is Francis of Assisi, Dominic and Ignatius of Loyola, Loyola 
uh, who founded religious orders that became famous for their missions to the Americas, into Asia, as well as, as Africa. And uh, when you then study church history, and obviously there are volumes and volumes and volumes written just in, on church history, you see how the church and church leaders took this task very, very seriously by entering into the world um, and, and preaching the gospel and establishing churches in every uh, place. As you look at the history of missions, which is intertwined with the history of the church, uh, William Carey, for example, was the first Protestant who really went on a, on a mission to, con to convince the church in England that they should be doing missionary work. Uh, up to that point in time, I guess to a large extent, the Protestant movement was, was mostly uh, consumed by establishing, establishing itself. But William Carey had this vision, and uh, he is remembered as the father of modern Protestant missionary mo the movement. He helped found the Baptist Missionary Society uh, in England and went to India as its first missionary. Hudson Taylor found the China Inland Mission, which is modern-day OMF, uh, to reach China's millions with the gospel. Adoniram Judson planted the church in Burma. Moffat Livingston, C.T. Studd, took the light of the gospel into the heart of Africa. Uh, there are, these are just a few of the hundreds and thousands down the ages who responded to the call of Jesus to go into all the world and to make disciples and to preach the good news to all creation, to quote uh, Mark 16. The gospel is spreading. Um, the gospel has not always spread the way it should have, but uh, there were ups and downs in the church history and missionary movement. But despite the fact that the church throughout 2,000 years did not always understand the importance of missions, the church always took its cue from the early apostles. And there was always somehow the Holy Spirit worked in the hearts and the minds of different people. And always there's been this vision to reach out and to take the gospel beyond um, the, the borders of one particular country. While the church's mission to foreign nations was not without its problems, it's interesting to, to note that the Roman Catholic Church was in the front lines of the missionary movement. If you go to Latin America today, you will find the Roman Catholic Church extremely strong uh, because that is where missionaries ended up going uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. Today, with modern uh, technology, uh, with transport, with new forms of communication, uh, whether it is uh, with radio waves or television, uh, the internet and networks that we are using, um, the social networks as they are called today, there are plenty of ways in which missionaries nowadays reach out, uh, with sometimes without having to physically go, um, but, but oftentimes it, it takes someone to physically go to another country. And so, yeah, the church, both Roman Catholic and Protestant, which the major movements uh, around the world have been faithful to this task, to a large generation. There are those who even believe that the task can be f uh, completed in our generation. And we'll look again um, a little bit later at their definition of what it means to be completed. Some of the definitions and explanations around the concept of going or missions uh, I want to, to highlight. Is it mission or missions? Well, to be technically correct, there is only one single mission, and that is the Missio Dei, the mission of God. Uh, it is the only mission that there is. Now, the church participates in God's mission in this world. The moment I share the gospel with another person, I'm doing what God wants us to do, and that what God himself did. Jesus is God's mission into this world. If therefore I share Jesus with another person, I am therefore participating in the mission of God. I'm sharing with them the fact that God exists, that God is a loving God, that we have sinned against God, but that God himself provided uh, salvation for us, and therefore we can put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And so we are participating in God's mission by helping people bow before the living God, and therefore acknowledge him as king, and therefore his kingdom is extended. Now, although this is a bit of a technical uh, distinction, we can say that the church has only one single mission, but that Christians are involved in many missions in the plural. And since there are many places and many different kinds of people and many different ways in which the gospel is shared uh, with uh, people around the world. However, 
it has become very customary for us to talk about missions in the plural. Although, I think for most of us, we don't think plural when we say the word missions. We say, we are involved in missions, or I support missions, or uh, we have people doing missions or missionary work uh, out in another country. I don't think the technical distinction is that important. As long as we understand Theologically and biblically speaking, there's only one single mission. And uh, there are not hundreds of different missions uh, that we're on. We're only on one mission, and that is to share the gospel with a dying world. Uh, there are different ways in which we do that. And so whether you talk about mission or missions, at the end of the day, as long as you have a correct understanding, uh, makes no real difference. There are some different dimensions to the way that God's mission is fulfilled uh, in this world. We can share the gospel with sinners in our own community. And this is often referred to evangelism. And then when we uh, focus on preaching and church planting, we are proclaiming the gospel according to Romans chapter 10. We are making the truths about God known. People need to hear it. People will not know the truth uh, of God's specific revelation unless someone tells them about the specific revelation. That can happen by reading or listening to the radio or whichever way. But somehow their focus needs to be put on the specific revelation of God that He has given to us through Jesus Christ and in the written Word. And that results in more and more people coming to know Him and that results in church planting. We can also reach out to the needy with the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ. This is often referred to as social outreach. And then we can serve the poor, the hungry, the sick, and the persecuted. We can assist in bringing people together in peace and harmony. Um, and, and many, many Christians around the world are involved in the peace movement. Um, as long as there's an understanding that uh, it is not just bringing people into a peaceful reconciliation but it is also getting people into a reconciliation with God. There's got to be a vertical and a horizontal element to our peacemaking movement. We can bring the children of God into a united fellowship of love. That's one of the missions uh, or being on a mission for God. And so Christians by nature are missionaries to the extent that they have a holistic view of sharing the gospel with the world. And, and this is one thing that I do need to say, and I'll come back to this a bit later on and highlight that as a particular problem or a challenge, and that is that there are Christians who overemphasize the social side of our mission without sharing the gospel. And the, the argument is, if I give a person a cup of water, uh, somehow they will figure out that Jesus lives in my life. Um, and that may not be true, because they will, may never figure out that I'm giving them a cup of water because Jesus loves them and He died for their sins on the cross. But there's also another extreme, and that is, I simply come in and people may die around me of hunger, and I simply just hand out tracts, and I just preach the gospel and I leave without feeding them. And so you can see the tension on a continuum. There is an overemphasis on simply coming and sharing the gospel and leaving, not caring for the people. And there can be an overemphasis on the other end, and that is simply just handing out food without sharing the gospel, without letting them hear what the gospel is all about. So there's tension among even Christians when it comes to this particular aspect. When it comes to another distinction, uh, the church for many years now uh, has made the distinction, or Christians have made the distinction between missions or mission and evangelism. It has become customary to refer to evangelism as sharing the gospel with those around our church. And we will, we will often say, we need to go and do evangelism. We need to go and evangelize people. And then, it's only when we get on a boat or a ship or, a, or, a, or an aeroplane and we go somewhere else that we start talking about mission or missions. And in that sense, we refer to missions as far away or crossing the cultural barriers. I believe that, again, technically speaking and biblically speaking and theologically speaking, this is a false dichotomy. Uh, God is on one single mission, and that is to reach the unsaved with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And whether that person is my neighbor right next to me, or that person lives in China and I don't even understand his or her language, it is one single mission. And again, 
we can go, we can jump up and down and get all excited about we shouldn't make this distinction, but it is so customary now that I think in most of our language, our vocabulary, we simply know what we're talking about when we talk about evangelism and missions. But actually, there is no distinction. It is one single mission. We're on a mission, and that is to share the gospel, whether it's close by or far away. Some theologians and biblical scholars have pointed out to the fact that Acts chapter 1 verse 8, which I read at the beginning, provides us with a model for missions. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, and this is the way it works, and uh, if I can give you a sort of a graphic uh, explanation of that. You will work in Jerusalem, um, and you need to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You need to be my witnesses in Judea, and then also in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And in a certain sense, we are getting further and further away from home, where Jerusalem here um, is really where most of us are comfortable. And that is, the person who lives next door to me, who shares my culture, my language, and we are very comfortable. I don't have to cross any cultural barriers. The moment I talk about rugby or cricket or soccer or braai or whatever, we are speaking the exact same language. And therefore, I can speak to that person about Jesus Christ using imagery and using my life because it's very easy to do so. When we talk about Judea, then we are talking about an, a similar culture. Uh, we can still talk about Brian, rugby and cricket and so on, uh, but it is a little bit further away geographically speaking. Uh, this person may live in Cape Town or in Bloemfontein. I mean, to use our sort of geographical area around here. So it's no longer comfortably close, uh, culturally yes, but not geographically. And so we're starting to move away. And then when we talk about Samaria, now we're not talking about geographically that far away, but culturally miles away. The Jews and the Samaritans were culturally relatively close, but also miles away from one another. Uh, the whole story in John chapter 4, when Jesus speaks to a Samaritan woman, Jesus was crossing cultural barriers. Uh, he, they were not far away from home. They were literally just traveling from the southern province of Judah to the northern province, province of Galilee. But he crossed through Samaria, so it was relatively close. But to sit down and speak to a Samaritan woman meant that he crossed certain cultural barriers because the Jews and Samaritans were not too friendly with one another. And then it speaks for itself when you talk about um, end of the earth that you're now talking about crossing both culturally and geographically into a distant land. Uh, when, you, when you cross over the sea or over a country's border and you start speaking another culture, and it's no longer the same language and, and frame of reference and worldview. Um, when you go to the east from South Africa, for example, you go into some of the Asian countries, you are crossing major cultural barriers, um, let alone the, the uh, geographical distance to get there. Um, in the book of Acts, the, these different aspects happened, although over a time, but ultimately they happened simultaneously. And there was still gospel preaching going on in Jerusalem. There were still churches in Samaria and in Judea. And then you had Paul and others who traveled around the world. And there are uh, many scholars who believe that um, this should be true for every single church. That somehow, in some way, every local church should have some involvement in sharing the gospel with their own culture, uh, with people a little bit further away in terms of, let's say, church planting, and then also sharing the gospel in our particular situation, uh, living in the Santon region. Uh, it would be typically, for us, it would be uh, reaching out into Alexandra, where it's not far away. It's only 10 minutes, 15 minutes drive. But culturally speaking, we're crossing major barriers. And then, of course, the ends of the earth, once again, it speaks uh, for itself. Why do we do missions? What is the motive, motivation for missions to be involved in missions? Well, it makes logical sense. 
um, because we need to reach a world out there. It makes theological sense. And that is, if you have followed the big picture that I have been trying to paint over the last six weeks or so, then it is a logical and a theological, a God conclusion to where God is moving with this world. You cannot talk about creation right at the beginning and who God is all the way down to the second coming of Jesus without talking about missions. Without somewhere along the line talk about the fact that God has left us in this world with a mission. We are on a mission in this world. Now, it is also God's command. God commanded us to do so. We talk about the Great Commission. I read that in Matthew 28, uh, 19. Uh, and we will be disobedient to God if we don't do missions, if we're not involved in missions. There is an interesting reference in Matthew 24. Not all scholars agree equally with the interpretation of that particular reference. But in Matthew 24, 14, we find another motivation. Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And many missiologists or theologians or preachers will, will take this verse and say, uh, unless the gospel has reached the ends of the earth, unless the gospel has been preached to all nations, the second coming will not happen. In other words, by preaching the gospel to all nations, we are hastening the second coming or the arrival of the second coming. As I said to you, not all scholars agree equally with this particular belief. It is also driven by love. Uh, if we love God, we will love our neighbor. When Jesus was challenged on the greatest commands, he's, or the greatest command, he said, love your God with all your heart and soul and so on, and then love your neighbor. And he said, these two are equal. I cannot love God and not love my neighbor. Can I therefore look at my neighbor who is fast rushing towards hell without Jesus and not reach out in love? Can I say, well, you know, go to hell anyway. Uh, I hate you. Well, no Christian should say, I hate you. Because we don't hate people. We love people. If we love people, we should then have a logical approach to them and a biblical approach to them by sharing the gospel of Jesus with them. Because if we don't, we may be, uh, we may be party to them going off to hell by not sharing the gospel with them. There is another debate, and whether this is applicable to you or even of any interest to you or not, I don't know. But that is whether the local church is doing the missions uh, or reaching out in mission, or whether we should give the task to mission agencies. It is true that this is a massive task, and uh, after the break, I'm going to share with you some information from Operation World uh, and if you, if you dare to buy this book and pray through this, even if it take you, takes you a couple of years to do so, I want to really encourage you to do this because this will challenge you in terms of the enormous task that is before us. The world has not yet been reached. I mean, we've done a lot. The church has, but we haven't done everything yet. And so there's a lot remaining. And therefore, no local church can do all of the outreach that is ne necessary. And therefore, it is combining with other local churches, but then also, and this has happened uh, in the last number of, of years, where missionary organizations were formed to bring local churches together to pool their resources so that they together can reach out into the world. Many of these have become what is now known as para-church organizations. They no longer... Uh, a they no longer belong to a denomination. They work across denominations. They are no longer responsible or accountable to a local church necessarily. And they say that we are doing the work that the church should be doing. And rather than fighting that, I think the best way for us forward is to say, how can we join forces? How can we support the outreach uh, of the gospel or, or taking the gospel in the world by using uh, these mission agencies, um, as I said to you, most local churches do not have the resources or the infrastructure to take a missionary couple, for example, a family, 
uh, put them in China or in Thailand or in Mongolia or wherever and give them all the money and all the support and the backup and the prayer support uh, that they need. Uh, it's just impossible. So mission organizations have really become uh, professional in the way they do this. And they have become focused on this task and most local churches now uh, join up with the mission organizations in assisting them uh, in, in, and then even sending their own missionaries via those organizations to go to uh, the mission field. The focus of, of modern missions uh, in the modern era with its access to technology and communication has seen the church and mission ag missionary agencies better equipped to assess the biggest areas of need in the world. It was especially during the 1990s that much research was done by missiologists, those people who study missions, using new and updated techniques to determine where the areas are that need special focus in order to give more attention to the unevangelized sections of the world. And this has led us as a church and as a, as a church worldwide to a much better understanding of where the needs are. And so a couple of things that I'm going to share with you right now uh, are the result of those uh, uh, specialized uh, assessments and research done by different people identifying groups of nations or people groups as they have become known with a particular language and a particular culture and how we can reach out. And the question ultimately is, is there a viable church movement among them? If not, then we regard them as an unreached people group. They may have Christians, individual Christians among them, but there is no viable church movement, evangel evangelical church movement among them. And if that is the case, they have been identified as unreached people groups. And this is where you may have heard the term the 1040 window. Uh, if not, then I want to define that for you. And, and on the map, uh, you will see uh, this particular section over here. Uh, this is a spread of the whole world, and that is the window, um, the 1040 window. Uh, and by way of definition, uh, quoting from home.snu.edu, most of the people groups still unreached by the gospel live in places stretching across the maps of northern Africa and Asia. Christian mission strategist Louise, Louise Bush started calling this rectangular area or band around the world. Uh, the 1040 window. He used the easy to remember name because it lies across Africa and Asia from 10 degrees latitude north of the equator to 40 degrees latitude north of the equator. And that has become known as the 1040 window. There are others who started using other sort of names. Uh, the A World A Movement. Uh, others talk about other windows uh, like the youth is a window uh, that needs to be reached and so on. But in missionary terminology, the 1040 window uh, has become well known. What are the challenges in this 1040 window? Well, two-thirds of the world's population live in this window. That is more than 4 billion people. If we now have uh, 6 to 7 billion people, I, I don't know where the, the current count is, but uh, if that is true, then we have probably about 4 billion people who live in this band around uh, the earth. 95% of the people living in the 1040 window are unevangelized. They have never, some of them have never heard the gospel message ever. They have not heard about the Bible. They haven't heard about Jesus Christ. Not all of them, but many of them have not heard. 85% of those living in the 1040 window are the poorest of the world's poor. People living in some of the poorest conditions in India, for example, uh, three large world religions, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, are centered within the 1040 window. That's where you find the concentration of these people and with their, uh, almost their headquarters there. Half the world's least evangelized cities are in this window. And we talk about mega cities. Uh, and that information comes from snu.edu. The unreached 1040 window people, there are different interpretations of the numbers here. Uh, but here is a quote from uh, Wikipedia. Apart from the 6 million Jews in Israel, one source has the following estimate of unreached non-Christian populations in the window. That there are 865 million Muslims or Islamic followers. And that figure may have to be adjusted one way or the other. 
550 million Hindus, and then 275 million Buddhists, 140 million uh, in two, more than 2,500 tribal groups who are mainly pagan or animist. Uh, animist meaning they are pagan, uh, they worship all sorts of different kind of idols uh, and that sort of thing, and they won't regard themselves as being part of any of these major uh, religious movements. And so with that information, and I want to leave you with that information as we take a short break and, and have some tea together, uh, and then we'll come back and look at the challenge uh, before us as we look at what the church's task still remains to be done. Now, welcome back. And um, it's as we look at the unfinished task of the church, in other words, what remains to be done? I have uh, some years ago discovered a wonderful PowerPoint presentation on the website by Operation World. It's called operationworld.org. And at the time, it had a PowerPoint presentation where uh, it tells you pictorially uh, how the picture in the world or what the picture in the world really looks like. Uh, with the updated version of the Operation World publication, the book itself, uh, they've also changed the website and updated the website. And that particular PowerPoint is no longer available. I, I thought I would be able to get an updated version. And so the one that I'm going to show you now uh, will not have the updated information, uh, which you can always go and check in Operation World, the publication, as well as on their website. Website is great because every day a different country is highlighted, so every day you can go and click on it, and uh, you can then pray for that particular country. And the website obviously then also contains updated information. In a year or two or three from now, some of the information in Operation World will be outdated, whereas the website can keep it updated as much as possible. So the information I, I will share with you dates back to 2006 when it was copyrighted, uh, and published on, on the web, and I've got that downloaded, and I'm going to show you an extract from, from that uh, publication. But when you look at the overall picture, it still gives you a picture of, what, of the reality around the world, because there haven't been dramatic changes in terms of massive a number of people coming to know the Lord in the 1040 window or around the world. So the bigger picture of what I'm going to show you will remain the exact same. The question is, where are we now when we look at the global situation around the world? When you look at, at this particular slide, you will see uh, everything in blue uh, is Christian. Now, immediately I need to define that because we talk about Christian in inverted commas. That is where a country like South Africa is regarded Christian because there's freedom of religion, there, there's a, a significant number of Christians, in fact, in our particular country, uh, at least 75% of the population here indicate on a census form that they are Christian. And so that is just large pockets of different religions. Everything in green uh, is where Islam is in the majority. And of course there are Christians there, but individual Christians in some churches. But by and large we're talking about Muslim countries. And then the yellow is uh, Hindu. It's, it's almost entirely India. Uh, and, and again, there are Hindu people around the world, uh, but that is their concentration. And then non-religious people, and you will see them uh, in places like Russia and other places uh, around the world as well. So that, those are the major world religions at the moment. And on this slide, and this, this picture, you will find uh, the concentration of Christians in blue. Um, and if you can see that on, on the screen you'll find roughly where the biggest concentration of Christians are. Uh, and, and you can see that in, in Africa, those parts. You can see the white spots there. That is obviously the north part of, northern part of Africa is Muslim. And then Europe and, and uh, North America, South America, uh, and so forth. When you look at, at the Muslim world, uh, this, is, this uh, is the green dots on the screen. And you'll find it concentrated in the northern part of Africa and around Asia. The Buddhist world is mostly Asia, and then when you go to the Hindu world, then you're talking about India primarily uh, as the Hindu world. The annual growth rate, this was in the middle of, um, let's say, the twin, the two, 2000, between 2000 and 2010, by 2006. Uh, you're talking about evangelicals growing at about 4.5% uh, 
uh, evangelicals, meaning those people who share the gospel and believe that uh, Jesus is the only way, that the Bible is God's revelation to us, and you have to have a personal relationship with God in order to say that you're saved. You're not just saved because you have church membership or you belong to any kind of church movement, but it's because you have a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is, that is growing in leaps and bounds, in fact, beyond the population rate. The Muslims grow um, over just over 2%, um, and, and it probably is true till today, uh, primarily by birth. Uh, because there are no birth restrictions, uh, and many Muslim families have five, six, and seven, and eight children, but, and they're growing as a result of that. So it reflects mostly population growth, although in parts of Africa, northern Africa, as the Muslim faith moves down Africa, there are some people who convert to Islam, uh, primarily because they uh, they are being socially cared for, or money is given, or buildings are built, mosques are built, and, and therefore some people convert to Islam. Um, the ethnic growth is also population growth. Hindu, 1.5%. Uh, Christians in general, that is, uh, including evangelicals and everybody who calls themselves a Christian, and they may be just part of a nation or a movement that is Christian, and that is also about 1.5%. Uh, so you can see the population growth there. Now, going back to the slide where we have the Christians uh, concentrated in different parts around the world, uh, if you then uh, uh, sort of do an overlay uh, of the unevangelized, then uh, you will see the blue uh, dots on that screen or on that picture. If I then add the red dots, you see the people who are mostly unevangelized, where the gospel has not yet made any significant impact uh, yet. So that gives you a bit of an overlay of that situation. The percentage of unevangelized people per country, um, and, and I want to point this out to you so that you can see that between 0 and 10 percent unevangelized, and uh, you'll see there's a big concentration of people in the Americas and southern part of Africa and so forth where people have been evangelized. Now compare that with 65% to 100% of people who have not yet heard the gospel. And that is the red dots. And again, you're talking North Africa and, and mostly uh, Asia. Um, and that is within that 1040 window. It's not restricted to the 1040 window, uh, but that is essentially uh, what that picture tells you. Now, when we look at the Western church and where we are now as a, a Western church, then... Uh, world Christianity continent by continent, and this is a very interesting graph because if you go back to the 1900s, for example, you will see that Africa, represented at the bottom of this graph, um, represented perhaps um, 2%, 3% of Christians uh, in the whole world population. Uh, Asia had Christians maybe 2 or 3%. And so forth. So most of the Christians came from Europe and North America. Just look at that. More than 80% of Christians were concentrated in Europe and in North America. That's in the 1900s. The missionary movement became very strong in the last century. And so as you move along uh, in the years, by the year 2000 and then by the year 2010, you can see, comparatively speaking, how the Christianity has grown. Uh, evangelical Christianity has grown in Africa and in Asia, Latin America, uh, and, and it now is more than half of the world's Christians live in those parts of the world. Um, that really means to a large extent that Europe is, is becoming less and less evangelical, less and less Christian, really. Um, that, that's, that's part of that uh, sort of concerning picture uh, that we have over there. As positive as it is for the other worlds, it is very negative when it comes to Europe and America. Now, the percentage of Christians who are evangelical in their faith, in Europe, uh, you talk about 2, 3, 4, 5 percent of European Christians are evangelical. That means that most of them belong to a church. If they're Christian, they belong to a church because their parents have been in the church. They've, they've got some kind of church membership they have been christened or whatever, but they don't ever darken the door of a church. And they definitely don't have a personal relationship with Christ. 
And so that is the situation in Europe, and that was some years ago. Latin America, again, because the Roman Catholic Church is very strong, uh, there is a strong tradition which is a cultural belonging to the church. But in terms of active faith, uh, in terms of evangelical faith, uh, it is not very, very strong. Now compare that to Asia. Um, and Asia uh, is, is both in China but also the strong numbers in South Korea. South Korea is, a, is an amazing story of how the missionary movement uh, worked and how the gospel came into the country and now uh, South uh, Korea is one of the biggest sending missionary sending nations uh, with, even compared to the US. US is still bigger uh, in size and in numbers of missionaries but percentage wise the South Koreans are taking over very fast uh, and so on. So th those are the percentages of evangelical Christians uh, around the world. When you look at Europe nowadays uh, you're really talking about less than 1% evangelical. And just look at the numbers over here uh, in all these parts, like in Italy and other parts of the world. Less than 1% evangelical. Most of those countries have become missionary places. Uh, we, we know families who work in certain countries in Europe where uh, they are being persecuted. In fact, Greece is one of those places where they are literally being being chased out, and, and, and all they have done was handing out New Testament Bibles in, uh, written in Greek, and in modern Greek, and uh, they have been chased out because they, uh, in certain communities because they don't want them there. They belong to the Greek Orthodox Church, and that is simply a tradition for most of them. So evangelically speaking, uh, less than 1%, and so you can look at the comparative figures, 1 to 5% is the slightly darker blue, and then more than 5%, uh, the, the, the darkest blue uh, on that screen when you look at Europe. It's no wonder that some missions, mission missi missiologists and people refer to Europe as post-Christian and now even anti-Christian. In many, many cases, Europe has become anti-Christian. Not everywhere, but certainly in many places. So where are we now? When we look at the world evangelicals continent by continent now, um, these are the evangelicals uh, in 2010. Uh, just a year or so ago, and you'll see most of the evangelicals come from the other worlds. Uh, this is uh, America and Europe, but Asia, Africa, uh, and Latin America represent now the, the, the biggest proportion of evangelicals um, around the world. Here is an interesting um, bit of statistic, and that is, how, how does it work with cross-cultural missionaries? In other words, where people are sent out from a particular nation to go to another nation uh, when they cross those cultural barriers that I referred to uh, on the board uh, a bit earlier on. Where do they come from? Well, North America is still the biggest sending country in terms of numbers. 36% uh, of missionaries come from North America. They are Americans and they are literally everywhere around the world. 11% come from Europe um, and Asia, and that is essentially because both South Korea and nowadays China uh, and Chinese Christians have caught on and they are beginning uh, what they call uh, the Back to Jerusalem movement and it has nothing to do with the position of Israel but it has to do with the geographical spread of Christianity and they believe as, as Christianity reached around the world from, uh, from Jerusalem to Europe to America and now it's around, around the globe to China and the Chinese Christians are saying, we want to go back and reach all the way back to Jerusalem. And so it's become known as the Back to Jerusalem movement. And Chinese people, Chinese churches are sending out missionaries to Asia and other parts, and including Africa, uh, and because they believe they have a, a task to, uh, to share the gospel with other nations. So Asia has become a major mission-sending place. Uh, and that is certainly true for South Korea, as I said before. Africa... Looking in the background with only 6%, um, not many African churches have caught the vision of sending as mostly receiving missions or missionaries, but not sending missionaries by and large. Um, the World Mission Force, and here is a very disturbing picture, um, and I'll show you a couple of slides on this. Where, does the, where do the missionaries come from around the world? Well, back in the 1900s, look at where they came from, from the west. That's the large blue part there. 
as you move across on that uh, continuum and on the graph, you'll see by the mid-80s, uh, late 70s, mid-80s, 1980s, how the other parts of the world, South Korea and Africa and Asia, uh, Latin America, have started to catch on. And uh, by, uh, by last year or so, you're talking about 40% or so of the missionary population uh, or the mission force coming from other parts rather than Europe and, and, uh, and America primarily. And the prediction is that somewhere in the future, uh, not the distant future, in 2030 or so, 70% of the mission force will come from the other parts of the world rather than from the West. Now the task that remains, we're talking about unreached people groups, and it's a very imbalanced uh, picture when you talk about unreached people groups. Where are they? And um, I, I mentioned the research that has happened in the 1990s. And uh, what the researchers have done and missiologists have done is, is look at every single country, not by way of country, but by way of population groups within, uh, people groups within a particular country. Like South Africa has 11 official languages. So obviously there are 11 people groups already, but we know that there are many more languages spoken and there are pockets of people forming a cultural entity and missiologists refer to them as a people group and then the vision is to plant a church that is viable speaking their language and uh, sharing their culture and having the bible translated for them in their mother tongue uh, they call it the heart language so that uh, a person can pick up the bible and read it and immediately understand so i don't have to cross two or three languages in order to read the bible and that's true for places like india where you have multiple, multiple languages. There may be some common bigger languages and the Bible is available in those, but not available in all of the subcultures uh, and some of the dialects spoken in India and around the world. So those, those people groups, there are 2,700 Hindu people groups that are still unreached and that's maybe four or five years ago. I don't, I don't think the picture has changed very much. Uh, in the Muslim world, we're talking about over 4,000 people groups who have not yet got a viable church or viable Christians among them. Individual Christians, but no viable church and no church movement uh, that can plant churches. And that's, that's the other thing that we look for. We're looking for a church that is a, a multiplying church. In other words, a church that can take the gospel and reach their own people. And um, among the Buddhist nations uh, or groupings, there are a thousand people groups that are still unreached in tribals, uh, we're talking 2,000 people groups and so on. Now, when we talk about the task that is still remaining before us, the, the millions and billions of people who still need to be reached with the gospel, many of those people will never hear the gospel unless a missionary comes to them. Let me, let me just quickly say that God can do anything. We have testimonies of Muslim people who have seen visions and have dreamed dreams and they've seen Jesus come to them in some way or the other, but they still don't have a Bible. They still need to hear specific revelation. So someone needs to come to them, like the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. He was a searcher. He was a seeker. He came, he, he adopted Judaism as his faith. And so God knew that he was a seeker. And so what did God do? He sends Philip to him to preach the gospel to him. He was reading from Isaiah, and uh, Philip was able to use the gospel in his hearing so that the faith could come from his heart, and he became a believer. A similar thing happened to Cornelius. Cornelius in Caesarea was a seeker. The Jews in the area uh, gave testimony that, that uh, Cornelius helped them. He, he handed out alms. He, he helped the poor. He helped um, the Jews in the community. So he was obviously a seeker. He, he, he never hated them. He was a seeker. And what does God do? He gives Peter a vision, and Peter goes to Cornelius, and Peter preaches the gospel to him. So somehow or the other, someone needs to still explain the gospel to them, even though God may use all sorts of means, including dreams and visions and other things. And whether the, the message comes via the radio or a television station or internet or whichever other way, somehow or the other they still need to hear. And so this is the story of imbalanced sending. Now l listen to this. Um, the world population can be divided roughly into, let's say, 33% Christian, 
uh, 27% unevangelized. They haven't heard. The red there is un they have never heard the gospel. And then there are 40% who have access to the gospel. In other words, they're within reach. That's my neighbor who is not a Christian, but he has been evangelized, if you wish. And there are many countries where the gospel is freely available, and so they're not an unreached uh, area or a country. Now, where do the missionaries come from? from? Now, look at this picture. The missionaries serve 80% in reached areas. In other words, they, they work in South Africa, they work in America, they work in parts of Europe and, and also in South America, where the gospel is relatively freely available. And only 2.5% of missionary, the missionary force work in the unreached areas. Compare that with the 27% of area and only two and a half percent of the missionary force actually work in those areas so there's obviously an imbalance in terms of sending there are many reasons for that and we don't have time to discuss uh, all of that uh, that includes the fact that for every one missionary out on the field you need 10 people 10 people back home to support them financially and in prayer and everything else uh, if we are 10 christians we can't all 10 of us pack up and go because who's going to support us uh, financially and otherwise so obviously those things need to be taken into account. But the fact still remains that there is an imbalance uh, in sending. Look at the number of missionaries present on this particular map, this world map, and you'll find less than 20 missionaries per million residents in any country, uh, the dark red over there. So that's less than 20 people working for every million. And um, when you're taking about over 100 people per million, those are the yellow areas, and it's obviously South Africa at the bottom, uh, North America, some parts of South America, uh, and parts of, of Australia, and, and so on. And so that gives you an idea of the imbalance that there is, and the task that still remains open uh, for us. Now, having mentioned the major world religions, I thought it may be a good thing to just briefly, and I... I will never give myself out as an ex ex expert on every, every uh, area that I'm going to touch on. But I found uh, some very, very helpful information, and you're welcome to go to this website. It's called comparativereligion.com. And um, I'm just going to give you a summary uh, of the major world religions. Why is it so difficult to reach them? Uh, I have been on a mission, a short mission trip to Thailand, and um, 95 uh, percent of the country, pop, the country's population are Buddhists. They are totally and utterly steeped in Buddhism. They are born Buddhists. Whereas in our particular situation, in my family at least, I was brought up and I tried to bring my children up in a way where I said to them, uh, and I was told that I need to come to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what evangelicals believe. And so I was never a Christian unless I, or until I made a decision of my own to follow Jesus. I was in a Christian environment, but I was not a Christian according to the biblical definition. Now, in Thailand and in most Buddhist cultures, that is not the case. You are born a Buddhist, full, full stop. You don't even have to ever say, I am now a Buddhist or, or I now claim to be a Buddhist. You're just simply a Buddhist by birth. And so that's one reason why it's so tough to reach out to the Buddhist world because it's so much part of the culture and to break out of that culture and to become a Christian is very difficult for them. So when we look at the Islam or the Muslim religion, we learn that Muhammad was the founder of the, the, the Muslim faith and he was born in 570. Now, for those of you who have never heard the birth date of Muhammad, this may come as a surprise. In other words, we're now talking about Christianity being on the scene for almost, uh, well, about 500 years, uh, more than 500 years. So Christianity has spread uh, and is a very solid and well-known world religion by now. Then Muhammad comes onto the scene um, and he fiddles a little bit with different religions, a little bit of Judaism. He reaches out to them. They don't want him. Uh, he tries Christianity. He actually traveled with his uncle uh, around the world as a businessman and he had access to these different kinds of religions. And when uh, both Judaism and Christianity rejected him, he then claimed that he had uh, some visions which were written down, um, and uh, he believed that he was the final prophet 
of the Jews and the Christians. And of course, Abraham was a prophet. He was there. And David, Moses, even Jesus features uh, in the background to, to his faith. But he was the one who came to correct all of the wrong beliefs. And so they have two sacred texts, the Quran, uh, which are the words of Allah, the only and true or the one true God. And as, as it was given to Muhammad, he was the one who received it. And then also the, the uh, Hadith, which is a collection of Muhammad's uh, sayings. And so those two texts are sacred uh, to the Muslims. Uh, to be a good Muslim, uh, you are born into the Muslim faith, um, primarily. Uh, but you can also adopt uh, the Muslim faith. And then if you do, and if you grow up in this faith... There are five pillars of Islam as they are known. The first is that you need to recite the Muslim creed. Just as we have a statement of faith, for them it is, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger or Muhammad is his prophet. And they firmly believe that and that makes you a Muslim. You then need to pray five times a day uh, facing Kaaba in Mecca. Uh, you must donate regularly to charity. Uh, you must fast during the month of Ramadan. And the Muslims believe that this is the month that Muhammad received the Quran uh, from Allah. And you must also make a pilgrimage. Started with uh, once a year or once a month and then once a year. And then uh, at least it's once in a lifetime now. Um, and um, countries are, because of the flood to Mecca, uh, countries are restricted by number. You can only send X number per country to go to Mecca. Otherwise it creates a, a flood of people uh, in the city. Muslims believe, um, they believe that there is only one God. Um, there is one creator who is just, omnipotent and merciful. They also believe in Satan who drives people to sin. All unbelievers and sinners will spend eternity in hell. Muslims who repent and who submit to God will return to a state of sinlessness and go to paradise after death. They respect prophets, as I said uh, before, uh, such as Abraham, Moses and, and Jesus, those whom we believe in uh, or accept. But they find the concept of God, or of Jesus as God, or the divinity of Jesus, totally unacceptable. Um, and um, they do not believe that he actually died on the cross. He was a prophet. Muslims uh, believe that Jesus was not crucified and that he didn't rise from the dead, but that he ascended to heaven and that he will come back uh, one day. They uh, deviate from us in that respect. When it comes to Buddhism, again, very, very briefly, some information about that. Buddhism developed out of the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, who in 535 BC, in other words, a thousand years before Muhammad was born, uh, this man, uh, according to Buddhism, reached enlightenment. And then he assumed the title of Buddha. Now, many years after his death, his teachings were written down in a collection called the the Tripitaka, and incidentally, all of the Quran was also written down after Muhammad's death. And so it's not as if he wrote it all down and it's authentic material, or, uh, uh, despite the fact that they will claim that. Um, there are many versions of the Quran, but they deny all of that. Uh, Buddhists believe in reincarnation. In other words, I can come back into this life. In fact, I do come back to this life, and that one must go through cycles of birth, life, and death, and after many such cycles, if I have lived a perfect life, and be very, very clear on this, I must live a perfect life, then I will reach enlightenment. They don't know anybody apart from their claim that Buddha, uh, or that this particular man, reached enlightenment. That is what enlightenment is. It's living a complete perfect life. Even the slightest wrong thought in my mind will deny me enlightenment. And therefore, I will then, when I die, come back as something, if I'm a big sinner, I'll come back as something lower. I could come back as an animal, a dog or something. Or I may, I may come back as a higher being. And through many of these cycles, ultimately, uh, I will reach nirvana. And the interesting thing is that many Christians, or many of us don't know, is that nirvana is not heaven. It is just a state of nothingness. So I just completely disappear. And this, this cycle of coming back, uh, is now gone and broken. And I, I just, I, I am just no more. So it's just a state of total uh, nothingness. Not a whole lot to aspire for or to. Uh, what the Buddhists believe, a true Buddhist believe 
that there is no God or a creator. In fact, they don't believe in God or any type of God or creator. Uh, they don't believe in the need of a savior. They don't believe in prayer or eternal life after death. And you can then imagine how difficult it is when I come and say, Jesus died for your sins and he wants to take you to heaven. Well, number one, I don't believe in God. There is no creator. Uh, I, I don't pray. And uh, there is no life after death. Uh, in, in fact, if, I, if they, whatever there is, I'll come back into this life. Uh, being reincarnated. So the concepts are so completely different that it makes it very, very challenging for missionaries living in that society. Some of our missionaries don't even talk about the normal salvation language that you and I would use, and that is, you're a sinner, uh, Jesus died for you, you need to confess, and then God will save you and He'll take you to heaven. Because it's foreign language. Uh, they don't believe in all of that. And so what many missionaries try and do is connect them to Jesus, the one who walked on the earth, and, and to elevate Jesus in their minds. And once they become a follower of Jesus, then the teachings of Jesus will help them to come to an understanding of what sin and salvation and heaven and those things uh, are all about. Hinduism is another one of the major world religions. The origins of Hinduism date back to the Indus Valley civilization sometime between 4,000 and 2,500 BC. So we're going all the way back um, in, in time from, from Islam faith to Buddhism and now we're even uh, thousands of years BC. Though believed by many to be a polytheistic religion, the basis of Hinduism is the belief in the unity of everything. A totality called Brahman. The purpose of life is to realize that we are part of God and by doing so, we can leave this plane of existence and rejoin with God. In other words, I become God. And, and I am God. I'm part of God, separated from Him right now. But if I live a good life and strive for unity and everything else and peaceful, then I rejoin with God and I then am God. This enlightenment can only be achieved by going through cycles of birth, life and death. Again, we're talking about reincarnation. So I can come back and... And if I don't make it in this life, I may come back a little bit worse than before. Now, what is Hindu progress? A person's progress towards enlightenment is measured by his karma, uh, which is the accumulation of all the good and bad deeds. So it's on a scale. Uh, and uh, if my bad deeds outweigh all my good deeds, my karma is bad. Uh, and, and the other way around. So I try and do as many good things so that I can reach good karma. And this in turn determines my next reincarnation, coming back either as a dog or maybe even my mother-in-law if I'm really bad, uh, or uh, whatever it is. But some selfless acts, thoughts and devotion to God help uh, one to be reborn at a higher level, Why the opposite is also true, and I can be born as something worse uh, than I was. The Hindu castes um, is extremely entrenched, especially when it comes to uh, India. Uh, Hindus follow a strict caste system uh, which determines the standing of each person. Uh, I'm born into a particular caste. The, um, the caste one is born into is the result of the karma. In other words, my previous life was not that good. I didn't live, live a very good life. Then the chances are that I will be downgraded on the caste system. Um, and when you go to India, this plays a very, very important role. We, uh, we have some people in our church who, uh, a younger couple, and they belong to two different castes, and they fell in love. And it was a major issue for them to actually get permission from the two families, and especially the higher caste family, to approve the marriage with a lower caste person. And, and we're talking about levels of castes, and, and these two were actually fairly close to one another. Uh, only members of the highest caste, the Brahmins, may perform uh, the religious duties uh, such as being priests and serving in the temples uh, and so forth. Again, you can see how difficult it is for Christians, missionaries, arriving in India. And by nature, what do we do? We see people who are poor, poverty-stricken, and in need, and we reach out and we, we, uh, we serve them, we give them food, and we help them, we share the gospel with them. And what literally happened is initially is that many of the lower caste uh, Indians became Christians 
and Christianity became known as a religion for the lower caste. And so the higher caste people never wanted to touch Christianity. Um, so you can see the difficulties that, that missionaries are encountering uh, around the world. Now, as we draw to a close tonight, some of our beliefs about God. Um, everystudent.com makes the, the following uh, statement about different beliefs about God. Hindus acknowledge multitudes of gods and goddesses. And you have to keep everyone busy by bringing sacrifices and acknowledging them. If you don't, they will zap you. They, they live in fear of all of these gods around them. Buddhists say there is no God. There is no deity. New Age followers believe that they are God. Um, and, and we've seen a little bit of that as well. But Muslims believe in a powerful but unknowable God. And again, they live in fear because you have to go through these rituals, become very legalistic, do these things, and then you are okay. And then Christians believe in a God who is loving and approachable, one who reached down to us, came to us in and through Jesus Christ, and it's only by grace that we can be saved. When I live a good life, it's simply because I'm grateful to God because He saved me by His grace. And so when you really compare the religions on a scale, Christianity is the only one that says God reached down, God became man, God saved us. Uh, it's not because of anything that we have done. And that's the truth of the gospel. Some of the, the questions and issues around missions, some of the debates, for example, missionaries with all their best intentions have made and continue to make many mistakes Interesting to note that some of the Asian missionaries are repeating the exact same mistakes that missionaries made when they reached them. I'll give you one quick example of that. Uh, Europeans have been the ones reaching out, let's say, to uh, Korea or Asia or Africa or whatever, and with all that, they brought with them a particular kind of dress. Uh, you, have to, you have to wash in order to be a Christian, because good Christians wash and they are clean and they don't stink you know, or, or smell bad or whatever. Now, that's not really what the gospel is about. The gospel is about serving Jesus Christ. And um, that's one very, very silly little example. South Koreans m are making the mistake by, you may have heard the story about Korean, South Koreans and how they pray. Like four o'clock in the morning, the church is open and they have hundreds and thousands of people come. Four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, they pack out the churches to pray. And when South Koreans go around the world, uh, many of them make the same mistake now and they say, if you want to be a good Christian, you have to pray at 4 o'clock in the morning or you have to pray at 5 o'clock in the morning. So they want to start their own prayer, prayer uh, meetings. Now, there's nothing wrong in prayer, but it is a cultural expression for them. Prayer itself is a principle uh, that we need to adhere to. Now, some of the mistakes that missionaries make or uh, still make and have made is sharing their own cultural understanding and application of the gospel as the only way to do church. Uh, and if, if you want to be a Christian, then you have to look this way, smell this way, do these acts, and then you're a good Christian. Because that's what I'm accustomed to in my own home country. Another mistake that missionaries make is to fail to see anti-God or anti-Christian practices. This is when we are a little bit on the liberal side. We will, we will just bless another, another culture and say everything that you do is fine. Some of the cultural practices may include satanic and demonic activity, in which case we need to be very careful that we don't give our blessing to anti-Christian behavior or practices. And then the failure to allow a church in another culture to what we call indigenize the gospel. We want to bring the gospel message and allow a culture to take the message and make it their own and give it their own cultural expressions. Again, by way of illustration, European missions arrived in Africa and they brought with them the hymns with three verses and a chorus or four verses and a chorus with a particular rhythm and a particular style. And all that happened was they took the hymns, translated them into Zulu, Koza, um, whatever other African language, and the rhythm and the music remains exactly the same. But it's a purely European expression of music. Whereas the right way to do it would be to say to a local Christian, why don't you start composing a song and music, using music, 
that reflects your language, your rhythm, your culture. I know of missionaries who said to African people, drums are evil because drums were used in a particular environment to call up demons or ghosts or spirits or the spirits of the forefathers or whatever. So therefore, drums are evil. Now, that's not right. A drum is a neutral musical instrument. Any musical instrument can be used for wrong purposes and for, um, for demonic purposes as well. Some of the hard questions that we are facing in Christianity uh, and missions, what about the high cost of overseas missions? And especially when you pay in South African rands and when the uh, rand exchange, the, the, the dollar uh, rand exchange rate gets uh, out of control, then it becomes very, very, very expensive to send missionaries around the world. I'm not answering the question, I'm just raising some of the issues. What about if we fail in our task of sharing the gospel? Uh, and those who have never heard the gospel, will they then go to hell? Uh, it's a tough question to answer. What about those who have never heard the gospel? Will they go to hell? And if we don't do our task, well, in a certain sense, the answer is yes, they will. Because if they don't know Jesus, they will end up going to hell. What about the completed task and the second coming? Can or will Christ come before the task is finished? Now, that also then depends on how you define finished. When is the task really finished? And different theologians define that differently. And some say it is when the gospel is available to everybody. It doesn't mean everybody will respond to the gospel, but when the gospel is available around the world and everybody has access to the gospel, then the task, and only then will the task will be finished. Now that also fiddles a little bit with our theology of the second coming. Some people believe Jesus can come any day, today. Others say, no, no, he can't because the gospel has not yet been preached to all the nations and all the people groups. How do we define nations? Is it country-wise or is it people groups? Is it smaller people and cultural groups? And so the debate goes on and on. A couple of errors related to missions, the social gospel I've referred to before, uh, and that is we only serve people's needs, um, and, and it's through serving them that they will come to know God. My response to that is that they won't get to know God unless someone tells them about God and about Jesus and the cross and about salvation. Unless someone tells them about that, they won't come to know Jesus. And then the gospel at home theory, you have heard this many times before, we have so many unsaved people in our neighborhood. Why do we spend all this money to send a person to China? Um, now, that is a, a false belief. I think the Acts chapter 1-8 model says to us that we need to do all of those uh, simultaneously. We don't wait until we have enough money uh, or until our neighborhood is reached. Our neighborhood will probably never be, be, be reached completely. And then New Age and pluralism, those things are major dangers to Christianity today. And that is, we should not mess up other cultures by sharing with them the truths or the facts uh, that go against their background and culture. There may be people in the Amazon. We shouldn't go there with the gospel of Jesus because they are quite okay. They've survived for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, we should just leave them as they are. Uh, and that's a typical New Age sort of argument. Now, of course, there are other issues that we need to take into consideration. I just recently heard of a new tribe that was discovered somewhere, uh, actually in, in aerial flights over a particular area where they discovered a, a new group that has never been discovered. Now, the, uh, we, we are now clever enough not to just barge in there with our Western illnesses, because that's another problem. You arrive there, you've got a bit of a sneeze, they've never been exposed to a cold, and uh, you spread a disease before you know it, that whole culture can, can die. So, of course, there are other issues that need to be uh, kept in mind. And then, of course, there's the argument that God does not need our help. God can save people, so He doesn't need our help. I think it goes directly against the Great Commission where Jesus said, Go, I am sending you. I want you to go and spread uh, the, or share the gospel. And then an extreme version of predestination, and that is God will save people. He, they have been predestined, elected, and therefore it, it makes no difference whether we share with them the gospel or not. God will save them anyway. And I think that is also an unbiblical uh, concept. I've included a couple of songs. I want to highlight this one, which I, I think most of us know. And it says, May we be a shining light to the nations, a shining light to the peoples of the earth. 
till the whole world sees the glory of your name. May your pure light shine through us. This is a wonderful missionary song, and I think most of us know the tune. Um, and hopefully it's something that will help us as we reach out. What to do uh, during this week? Uh, some of the reading. Uh, where do you fit into this mission picture that I have painted tonight? Uh, and, and do you pray? Uh, do you actually pray for missions and missionaries? I want to encourage you to get Operation World, but at the same time, it's overwhelming. And so the other bit of advice that I want to give to you is to, to identify a particular uh, place or area that's on your heart. Uh, for example, I'm praying for Turkey. Uh, for some reason, God has brought Turkey into my, into my world. Um, the other one is Thailand, where I spend some time um, on a short-term mission. Uh, and, and so I'm trying to focus my prayers rather than say every night, oh Lord, pray and bless all the missionaries. or we'll save all the people in the world. Uh, I want to be a bit more specific and to pray. I pray for Turkey, Lord. I, I pray that you would send people there and that you would open their eyes to see the gospel and so forth. And then consider joining a short-term mission trip. I, um, next year, I'm hoping to lead a group uh, or to take a group to eastern Turkey where it's a prayer journey because you can't openly share the gospel at this stage. Uh, it, it opens your heart, it opens your mind, uh, apart from the fact that you travel around the world a little bit, uh, but just doing, and being a, doing some missions and being exposed to that really is mind-blowing and opens your heart and your world. Next week we're going to talk about the second coming, and I do want to uh, remind you about the handing in of a paper uh, about the second coming that is due today and then use this week to think about and pray for missions more specifically uh, than you have done before and I'll see you next time.